would open your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 34. Our study this morning will center on the first eight verses of this particular text. I first preached this sermon 22 years ago, and, uh, and to my knowledge, I've not, I've not preached it since. But I wanted to preach it because of the day that is before us with the appointment of new elders and to uh, exhort the four men that will serve or now are now serving as elders and then also to encourage uh, the church, the members here uh, with regard to this. And, and over the next several weeks, I do plan to, to preach on uh, individual responsibilities that Christians have to uh, the local church, as well as uh, do a more extensive study on some of the aspects, characteristics of the eldership. In other words, to, today is, of course, is really last week and, and this week are really just lessons on what you ought to expect from elders, from an eldership. But today, specifically, on what happens when and eldership fails in its responsibilities. And so uh, I hope that you've turned to Ezekiel uh, chapter 34. We'll read the first eight verses and then look at uh, the subject, When Shepherds Fail. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth. And no one was seeking or searching for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey. And my flock became food for every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, nor did my shepherds search for my flock. But the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Verse 10 says, I will require my flock at their hand. The subject matter again this morning is when shepherds fail. Number one, when shepherds fail, principles are forgotten. Principles are forgotten. In verses 1 through 4, we find that the principle, the basic principles of shepherding were forgotten or completely ignored by the shepherds. In fact, they were doing the very opposite of what they should have been doing. It wasn't, it wasn't just that they weren't doing their jobs. They were doing the very opposite of the jobs that they had been commissioned to do. Note verse 2 where the Bible tells us that the shepherds served themselves rather than the flock. They served themselves rather than the flock. It says you eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool. In other words, the shepherds saw the flock simply as a means of personal gain or comfort. And that's not the role that shepherds are divinely ordained uh, to, to, uh, to play. Secondly, the sheep were plundered there in verse number 3. They were plundered. Rather than being fed, they were plundered. And we talked this morning about, about the plunderers in our Bible class. That, that the plunderers exist when there is... Uh, the, the, the plunderers exist... When there is no one to resist. 
In other words, when 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 all is said and done at the at the end at the end of a, a battle or the end of a war, the victors come in and they just gather this. They say, "To the victor go the spoils." And by the way, you can read all through you can read all through the Old Testament where where both Israel was plundered and when they were the plunderers when when they defeated uh, their enemies. But in this particular case, the shepherds were plundering. They were plundering the sheep. In other words, the plundering the flock. They were taking the best and ignoring the rest. And then verse 4. Actually, end of, of verse 3. You, don't not, you do not feed the flock, but the sheep end up being neglected. Not only are they not fed, what does the text say? The weak are not strengthened. I mean, this is straight out of the text. The sick are not healed. The broken are not bound up. Whether that means with if they have a wound where you bind a bandage around that wound, you put oil in that wound and you bind it, or whether it be a broken bone where a splint and a wrap is required. In other words, whatever it is that's broken has not been properly attended to. The lost are not sought. Now there's the one that I left out, that those that were driven away, you have not brought back. But... I left that out just because I want to talk about the other four in a little bit of detail later on. This whole situation, God says, if you, if you look at the, first of all, you need to understand, Ezekiel is a captivity prophet, okay? In other words, he was a prophet in Babylon when the children of Israel, had, after they had already been carried away into captivity. I believe even the third, the third plundering of of. Uh, of of Israel was the work at the time of Ezekiel's work. You know there was the there was one there was a a, a destruction in 586 BC. Uh, there was one uh, actually in 606 BC. There was one in 597 BC, and a final one in 586 BC. And Ezekiel was a part of God's work after that third plundering in 586 in 586 BC. But what you see in the context, so you understand, God is blaming the captivity on the shepherds. He's blaming the captivity on the shepherds. Why? Because they didn't do their job in Israel in teaching the people you know, to love the Lord, to obey the Lord, to serve the Lord. And because they failed in their responsibilities in Israel, they were carried away into captivity into Babylon, and then they were in captivity in Babylon, and they still weren't doing their job. And so God, God is holding the shepherds responsible for the events leading up to the captivity and to the, the, the conditions of the captivity. He said, you've been carried off into captivity, and yet even now you are still not bringing home those that were driven away. You're still not bringing home those that were driven away. And so the reason I left that out of this list is because that really doesn't apply if we're going to make a real-life application to elderships, shepherds today. You know, there are none that are driven away, but the other four certainly apply. So that's why I left that one out. And then lastly is you see in verse number four it says, You have not sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty... You have ruled them. Now, the word cruelty in the King James is rendered rigor. Rigor. R-I-G-O-R. It says, the sheep were ruled with rigor rather than being led by love. Ruled with rigor rather than led by love. And as soon as I read that word rigor in my studies, I'll tell you where my mind went. Exodus chapter 1. There arose a king who knew not Joseph in Egypt. And it says, They caused Israel to serve with rigor. Rigor. But the point is, hardness. Harshness. By the way, that's Exodus 1.13. Exodus 1.14 says, They made Israel's life bitter. They made them hate their own existence. 
That's what Egypt did to Israel, and that's what the shepherds did to Israel. Now, the very people who were given to protect and teach and love and encourage them were the people who were causing them to be ruled with rigor. Ruled with rigor. That word is so, it's just so powerful in this context. Elders are not to be lords over the flock, but examples. They're not to take oversight by compulsion, but willingly. What causes a man to be willing to take oversight of a local church if it is not love? Shepherds must lead with love. Number two, what happens when shepherds fail? The people flounder. There's over and over again through this text you read, my sheep were scattered, my sheep were scattered, my sheep were scattered. Again, what happens when sheep are scattered? They're, they're just wandering around aimlessly. They're in danger. And obviously, they become, they become prey uh, for predators. You know, God does not want his people to flounder. By the way, you can read this in Jeremiah 23, 1, Jeremiah 50, and verse 6. Over and over again, God condemned the shepherds for allowing the sheep to be scattered. Now, now draw this contrast with what we talked about last week. Last week we said... The shepherd is not responsible when a single sheep is lost. But he is responsible if that sheep stays lost. Right? And see, there's a difference between a single sheep somehow being moved away from the flock and being lost temporarily and all the sheep just scattering about, you know, like, like a cubby of quail. And so the people flounder when there is no shepherd. There's no direction. There's no security. There's no safety. There's no purpose. All of those things are lacking when shepherds fail the local church. The shepherds, ultimately, we would say, were negligent. They were negligent. And by the way, if you read Matthew 9, 35 to 38... Jesus was moved with compassion upon the multitudes because they were as sheep having no shepherd. Look, floundering, a floundering flock breaks Jesus' heart. A floundering flock breaks the Lord's heart. And by the way, there were all types of situations we might mention how people floundered. In the first century. Think about this. And this is the one that came to mind. And I put it down. John chapter 4, 21 to 24. Jesus with the woman at the well. And she was a Samaritan. All right. So what, you know, think about, what do you have in the lives of the Jews at, at the time of John chapter 4? Well, you've got Jews that are being ruled by Pharisees and Sadducees. And those people are floundering because they can never satisfy the Pharisees. Ever. No, nothing they do is ever good enough for the Pharisees. That's why Jesus said, said uh, don't give that which is holy to the dogs or cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them underfoot and, tear, and turn and tear you into pieces. Jesus was warning the peop his people, forget the Pharisees. You don't serve the Pharisees. As long as you're trying to serve the Pharisees, you're just flailing. You're never, you're never going to be... Good enough. And so when people flounder, it, it breaks the Lord's heart. So you have the Jews floundering under, under the, 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 the thumb of the Pharisees. Then you have proselytes. And, and you know where, where do they fit in in the lives of Jews? And then you've got the Samaritans who were half Jews. And that was what was going on here in John 4. She said, the, you know, our fathers worshipped in this mountain. That's Samaria. You know, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Again, our fathers worshipped in this mountain. You say you're supposed to worship in Jerusalem. What's that? That's floundering. We don't know. In other words, what is right? Were our fathers right? Are the Jews right? And Jesus said, there's going to come a time, woman, when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem are you going to worship. 
It says, because salvation is of the Jews. And he was talking about the coming of the church. And that the church would be a worldwide organization. Now, he wasn't explaining this to her, but that's what he's alluding to. And the church is going to be worldwide. And wherever God's people are, they can worship. Whether they're on a mountain or whether they're in a valley or they're somewhere in between. But you had the Jews, you had the proselytes, you had the Samaritans, and then you had the Gentiles. And a lot of the Gentiles wanted to hear Jesus. You remember that? You know, they went to Andrew and said, man, we want to, we want to hear about this. We want to hear some things about, about this Jesus. Floundering. No direction. In other words, there was, not, there was not a singular point of reference that everybody could look to. And then came Jesus. In John chapter 10, he said, verse 16, there'll be one flock and one shepherd. That was Jesus' solution. What was it? A unified, singular flock. He's talking about, of course, in that case, all men, Jews, Gentiles, and whatever you might consider there is in between. One shepherd and one flock. In other words, people are going to stop floundering under the shepherdship of the King of kings and Lord of lords. But when shepherds fail, the people flounder. And then number three, from verse five. They were scattered because there was no shepherd. And they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. When the shepherds failed, protection fails. It says the flock became as meat or food. This is why it's so important to have an eldership. You recall a couple of Sunday nights ago when I, when I spoke pretty strongly against the men's business meeting. Because the men's business meeting is generally not good for any local church. And, and that's why God never gave any, that's why God never gave any plan for the local church to run its affairs outside of having an eldership. So why, 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 is, why is the men's business meeting such a bad thing? I can give you the name of three congregations that I know of that were small, floundering congregations that all had an influx of a massive number of people who were dissatisfied where they were, and those churches were taken over by that massive influx of people. And how did they do it? Had a men's business meeting. In other words, there wasn't but seven or eight men, and now there's 58 men, and now the 50 are the, new, the 50 new ones are going to override the eight old ones. And they're going to get their way. Now, I can name you one in Mississippi. I can name you one in Missouri. And I can name you one in Tennessee. But a church that has shepherds can put a stop to that. They can put a stop to that. But when there are no shepherds, the church is left unprotected. Listen, y'all, if our job as elders is nothing else, it is to stand on the front line to protect the Burleson Church of Christ. If we don't do anything else, we've got to do that. Be thankful. And I'm not saying you're not. I'm just encouraging you. Be thankful. That somebody, somebodies are willing to stand up and stand in the front and watch over and protect this flock. When there are no shepherds, protection fails. Number four, verse six. When shepherds fail, priorities falter. Look at verse six. My sheep wandered through the mountains, every high hill, scattered over the whole face of the earth, and no one was seeking or searching for them. No one was seeking after the lost. And yet, the good shepherd said what? I am come to seek and to save that which is lost. Luke 19 and verse number 10. 
The shepherds became concerned with their own pursuits and not concerned at all with the flock. In Joshua 21, 25, when there are no shepherds, every man will do... In, in, in Joshua's case, it says there was no king in Israel. Which, by the way, if you'll read your Old Testament, you'll find that oftentimes the kings were referred to as shepherds. Because God knew that whatever direction the king wanted to go, the people would follow. David was called a shepherd of God's people. He was a real life shepherd, but he was also a shepherd of God's people. There was no king in Israel. What happened? Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Folks, you want to talk about a recipe for disaster. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. In James 1 and verse 25, the Bible tells us that we are to be not only hearers of the word, but doers of the work. And we need to get to work. First of all, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 1, if any man desires the office of an overseer, he desires a good work. Paul told Timothy to do the work of an evangelist. God gave shepherds, evangelists, and teachers for the work of the ministry. And by the way, that work of the ministry includes everybody. Go down to verse 16. The body grows when every member does its part. The work of the ministry. We must get to work. I know, look, I'm not saying we're not working now. All right? I'm not saying that. But there is still work to be done. And there are still some, even in this building, who are sitting on the sidelines. And that is not acceptable. That is not acceptable. By the way, the work that you do could be just as simple as what Hugh and Vicky did for their neighbor. That might make an eternal difference in the life of that man and potentially people that he knows, other family members. There is work to be done, the work of the ministry, and that means everyone. Then lastly, verse 5, and this has been read time and time again through this text. When shepherds fail, predators feed. Predators feed. In Matthew 7 and verse 15, the Bible says, Beware of false prophets who come to you as wolves in sheep's clothing. Now, most of the time, when you're reading in your Bibles, when you read about wolves, you're reading about false teachers. But let me just put something in your mind. Sometimes a wolf can be found in the form of discouragement. How many Christians have lost their way because of discouragement? That wolf ate them up. How many Christians are not faithful to the Lord the way they should be because they're being distracted by what's going on in the world? They're being distracted by... Their jobs, unnecessarily. They're being distracted by kids' sports, unnecessarily. They're being distracted by vacations or recreation, unnecessarily. I mean, that's the stony soil. That's, I mean, the thorny soil of the parable of the sower. It's people that are distracted by other things and are not bringing forth fruit unto perfection. That thorn is actually a wolf in disguise. Wolves can take a lot of different forms. In Acts 20 and verse 8, Paul said, Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he's purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in, not sparing the flock. Even He's talking to elders now. 
even from among your own selves shall men rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Treachery in the eldership. Wolves. And by the way, Satan's not described as a wolf. He's described as a lion. And I'll tell you this, his appetite is never satisfied. He's like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. Last thing I want to say to you this morning. And I've got it written down. I want to make, I want to make sure I say it right. With the, appointment, with the appointment of our elders today, I believe this church will see a commitment to shepherding that has not been seen in my 25 years here. With the four men that we have, there's never been four in 25 years. That's one reason why. But also this. At almost every point in my 25 years here, there has been at least, as, as, as the, in the most part, one elder who hasn't been 100% healthy. In January of 96, I sat in a room at Wade Nan's house with Wade and Walter and B.A. Armstrong. And B.A. looked at me and he said, I hope I've hired my last preacher. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, probably a lot of things. But one of the things that he understood was his days were numbered. His days were numbered. And then, just like every other man that's ever lived, he was gone. And Lynn stepped in, but then what? It wasn't long before him. You know, Wade got sick. And he wasn't 100%. And then he had to get out. And then what? Not long after that, what happened? You know, Walter made a turn for the worse. I mean, there's never been four healthy, active men to serve this church in the last 25 years. And I'm not, look, I'm not disregarding the church for the last 25 years. What I'm telling you is, this should be a day of great opportunity and joy. Because we've never had, we've never had the men, as we always say, we've never had the horses to run like we can run right now. And I'm going to speak for these three men. I, and I only told one of them ahead of time, and I, Philip and I were eating last night, eating supper together. I said, I'm going to speak for all of us. Our commitment to every member of this church, going back to Ezekiel 34 and verse 4. If you are weak, we will seek to strengthen you. If you are sick, we will work toward your healing. If you are broken, we will bind you up. If you are lost, we will come and find you. That is our commitment to this church today. Brethren, we will not fail you. We will not fail you. We will hold one another accountable. We will exhort and encourage one another. We'll continue to pray for one another. We'll exhort and encourage you. We'll continue to pray for all of you. One of the things that I've been doing over the last couple of weeks is I start praying and I just work my way back up. I work my way back up the pews because I know where y'all, everybody's got their scriptural seat. And I get done with that side and I go over the back and I work my way to the front. Now, Beulah, you're not sitting where you're supposed to, so I might, I might miss you. But that is our commitment to this church, to shepherd this flock the way that God wants us to shepherd. We covet your prayers and your cooperation to this end. I know this has not been an evangelistic sermon, but I, I really, really wanted to give this message to the church today. If it be the case that there is any here this morning that needs to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you believe with all of your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you're willing to live your life in accordance with that truth by repenting of your sins, and you're willing to confess your faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you can be buried in the waters of baptism this morning to receive the remission of your sins, 
washed from every sinful stain by the blood of Jesus Christ, Revelation 1 verse 5, and to leave this assembly living in the mercy of God and justified by His grace, Titus chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. To any child of God that needs to repent of sin, or if you have some spiritual obstacle that stands in your way between you and faithful service, you need to ask for the prayers of the church for help or for forgiveness. 1 John 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if you're here this morning in any way subject to the call and invitation of our Lord Jesus Christ, we plead with you to come right now. Together we stand and sing this song together. Why do you wait?